Africa Institutional Investors Advisory Council. For those of you who are not familiar with NASP, it is a 36 year old nonprofit trade and professional association dedicated to serving the interests of people of color in the financial services industry, particularly those in the banking, brokerage, and investment management sectors. NASP specializes in providing a vast array of thought leading programming that address the interests of its members and industry affiliates. In addition to curating content that seeks to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in our industry, NASP has also been at the vanguard of advocating for stronger connections between the United States and the African continent. In fact, in 2015, led by its future chairperson, Donna Sims Wilson, NASP hosted its first Africa Financial Summit. And in every year since, the summit, which has now been renamed the Africa and Emerging Markets Summit, has drawn participants from around the world to build upon those connections. In 2016, NASP partnered with the US Agency for International Development, USAID, to form MEDA, which stands for Mobilizing Institutional Investors to Develop Africa's Infrastructure. MEDA was formed to actively build bridges between US investment allocators and their peers, asset managers, and investment sponsors in Sub-Saharan Africa. Since that time, MEDA and the Advisory Council that I chair has sponsored several delegation trips to Africa, where US institutional investors have met with their counterparts and gained much needed exposure to investment opportunities there. To date, MEDA's efforts have mobilized roughly $1 billion of investments through its advisory council members. Importantly, last year, NASP spun out several members of its Africa-focused team to form MEDA Advisors LLC, an, ind an independent advisory firm that specializes in institution institutional investor to capacity building, development finance, and transaction advisory services. Now that we are hopefully on the receding side of the COVID-19 wave globally, NASP and MEDA advisors are very excited to sponsor today's discussion about strengthening the economic ties between the United States and Africa. We are particularly grateful to Chairman Gregory Meeks of the House Foreign Affairs Committee for giving his valuable time to join us today. I'd also like to add that Chairman Meeks spoke at our very first Africa Financial Summit in 2015, and then again in 2016. Chairman Meeks, thank you for always supporting NASP and its Africa journey. We are eagerly looking forward to your thoughts today about the new Congresses and the new administration's policy plans for US and Africa engagement. We're also excited to have a distinguished panel discussion today where several thought leaders will share their respective policy suggestions for driving US-Africa trade and investment. I won't call out all of their names now as Amrik will be introducing them to you shortly, but I do want to extend a very special thank you to Dr. Vera Songwe, Under Secretary General of the United Nations for graciously sharing her time and her perspectives with us today. Now with those salutations done, let's get to it. And I hand the program over to Amrik Saha, CEO of Media Advisors, to get us started. Amrik? Thank you very much, Lee, for those excellent opening remarks. And I would like to join you in extending a warm welcome to friends and colleagues from across the United States, Africa, and other regions who are joining us here today for this special discussion with Chairman Meeks. My name is Eric Saha, and I have the privilege to serve as CEO of MIRA Advisors. Over the last five years, MIRA, working with NASP and our Advisory Council of Leading Pension Funds and our research partners at Mercer and Standard Bank, we have been the leaders of leadership 
on how the United States can mobilize its institutional investors into African markets. And today, I am delighted to be moderating this discussion with the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He is the first black member of the United States Congress to lead this powerful committee, a committee that determines matters of diplomacy and war, a committee that authorizes the US foreign policy and its relations with foreign countries and international organizations, a committee that determines matters of international trade and international investments, including development assistance to foreign countries. Today, we'll focus on those economic ties with Africa. But before we get started, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit more about the chairman. I had the privilege to work for the chairman between 2013 and 2016 as his policy director. During those three and a half years, I pretty much saw him in action every single day he was in Washington. And I learned a great deal by seeing him in action, by understanding his values and principles and how they shape his thinking. Here's what I can share with you and why I think he is already proving to be a very different chairman and an impactful chairman. First, what you should know, Congressman Meeks is a man of humble beginnings. He grew up in public housing in New York. He often tells the story about his family as part of a wave of migrants from the South. He credited his parents for prioritizing the education of their children. And it's because they were able to buy a home for the years that allowed them to escape poverty and allowed them to afford his college education. While he, when he was studying law at Howard University, he could not buy any furniture. So he had to rent furniture from a business that provided assistance to those that did not have access to the traditional banking services. He understands what it means to be excluded, to be redlined by financial institutions, and how important it is to have policies that can lift people out of poverty by giving them access to opportunities that they won't have access to. We understand his values. And because of that, we believe that there'll be a greater, tremendous role for diversity, for inclusion, of, and for the African diaspora in US-African relations. Congressman Meeks is a true diplomat. From Howard University Law School, to Queens County District Attorney, to Chief Administrative Judge for the State of New York, he was first elected to Congress in 1998 to represent one of the most diverse congressional districts. For over 20 years, he's been a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Those experiences have made him a common sense leader, a true diplomat in his approach, which has earned him the respect of New Yorkers, of Republicans and Democrats. His approach to foreign policy has been based on multilateral principles. And we believe that the United States will be able to build greater coalitions with African states, with the private sector for a more prosperous future. Chairman Mix is a proud New Yorker. You would often hear him say that the city is so great they had to name it twice, New York, New York. He represents the financial capital of the world and he believes in the competitive edge of the US financial markets and its institutional investors working alongside African counterparts for mutually beneficial trade and investments. On the personal level, he is funny, he's easily approachable, he's somebody that you would be very happy to invite in your home or at the bar to watch the next game. When I became a dad for the first time to a little girl, we had cake in his office and having raised three little daughters, he had a lot of good advice to share. Congressman Meeks, we welcome you, we look forward to working with you and it's my pleasure now to turn over to you for your opening remarks. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Amarek, uh, look, you are indeed uh, someone that I had respect for and appreciate the three years that you spent in the office. And by that introduction, I think that you understand the policy of the office that even when you leave, you're still a part of it. So you never get away from me. So we appreciate you uh, so much for what you have done for us and the people of the 5th Congressional District and what you're doing on the broader capacity uh, now uh, with NIDA. And let me uh, just uh, thank also Lee for his leadership uh, with NASP. 
uh, and both of you for hosting this roundtable, which is tremendously important. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today, because uh, this is an important topic and one that I've made a top priority to address during my tenure uh, as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, let me give another quick shout out because, you know, all politics is local and President uh, Gregory Floyd is not only a distinguished president of the New York Teamsters Local 237 and a trustee of uh, uh, NYCers, he's also a constituent, meaning that he can vote for me. So therefore he becomes a VVIP uh, in this place. And I welcome anytime that uh, Gregory and I uh, have an opportunity to be on the same program. I look forward uh, to him offering uh, close to remarks to close out our discussion. Let me also take the time to thank all of the distinguished panelists for their participation today. You know, today's discussion could not have come at a better time. Under the Biden administration, the United States is re-engaging its international partners and reclaiming its position as a global leader. And part of the process requires us to recalibrate our relationship with our African partners, particularly in the area of trade and investment. The United States has a long-standing commitment to Africa, leading the world in providing healthcare, humanitarian aid, and development assistance. We also continue to stand with our African partners in their fight against transnational terrorism. That being said, it has been far too long that the United States has viewed the continent through the lens of conflict, poverty, and extractive industries or a power struggle with global rivals. Africa's population of 1.3 billion people, a majority of which are under the age of 20, is the fastest growing in the world. The UN estimates that three out of every four people added to the global population this century will be African, and that the continent will account for over a third of the human population by the year 2100. According to the OECD, Africa is on track to experience the fastest urban growth rate in the world. By 2050, Africa's cities will be home to an additional 950 million people. Rapid urbanization often leads to industrialization and advancements in ICT and drives major investments in infrastructure and services. For several decades now, many of the world's major economies have re recognized these important trends and understand their implications for global capital flows, trade and economic development. The American business and investment community must better understand the complex landscape that is Africa's markets. The perception of Africa as a risky place to do business as a whole is often based on generalizations and misconceptions that can have little basis in reality. And while some African countries must do more to foster a more conducive business climate, World Bank and other reports confirm that many African countries have in fact advanced major reforms to their private sectors. There is no excuse for conflating countries with very different conditions on the ground. You know, we don't paint other regions or continents with a broad pejorative brush the way we do Africa. Whether Asia, Latin America, or Eastern Europe, we recognize the broad range of development and stability that may exist from one country or region to the next. But when it comes to Africa, if there's an Ebola outbreak in Liberia, then we hear the fears of traveling to Kenya or South Africa. Each one of those are an eight hour flight away. Or if there's instability in one country or region of the continent, American business and media outlets perpetuate a narrative that Africa is unstable. What American companies and investors perceive about Africa manifest in their limited presence in the African markets. With few exceptions, where American businesses have invested in Africa often represents dated economic models focused narrowly on extractive industries rather than financial services or manufacturing 
or information technology or food value chain or services or human capital development. America's capital markets, investment funds, and financial institutions are leaders among their global peers. American investors should be best positioned to meet Africa's needs for capital, from financing structure, to knowledge and techno technological transfer, to capital allocation. The United States government and Congress in particular can play a very constructive role in supporting these efforts. To, the, to do this important work, the United States must adapt a proactive and fresh approach to engage in Africa in the areas of trade and investment. I will continue to champion four tenets in this regard. I call them the four Ds, development, diplomacy, democracy, and diversity. I preach this wherever I go. One on the development. We must shepherd our private and public sectors to harness massive investments in the food value chain, energy production and distribution, technology and infrastructure. Developing infrastructure is, a, is foundational for trade and economic development and requires a whole of society approach. And as we all know, infrastructure takes on many forms. We're talking about that in the United States today. It talks about roads and ports and power production and grids and water treatment and telecommunications, housing and office space, just to name a few. But development, uh, but development is just where we start. It's not just the physical infrastructure. It also includes building out the infrastructure to invest in human capital. African leaders must develop the strong policies and durable institutions required to draw foreign direct investment and build investor confidence in their economies and markets. Now I commend our African partners for launching what will be an economic revolution in Africa the African Continental Free Trade Area. The AFC FTA will elevate Africa's collective trading position on the global stage and lift tens of millions of people out of extreme poverty. America is an open economy with deep expertise in trade negotiations and establishing effective governance and dispute resolution mechanisms and engaging in trade facilitation all of which will be key pillars to the success of the AFC FTA. This is where the US diplomacy emerges as another important asset. Our diplomats and technical experts must continue to work our African partners to ensure that the AFC FTA and other regional integration initiatives succeed and capture the breadth of Africa's diverse economic landscape. Venture capital firms, tech startups, grassroots initiatives are all part of this landscape. Our diplomats also play a key role in supporting local and regional stability and continued forward development momentum, which are key to sustained economic growth. Now, one of the reasons I believe in the next, next D Diversity, because diversity is such an important part of what we bring to the table. It's because our policies and our people must reflect our values. By reflecting the diversity of America and the thriving African diaspora, the United States sends a strong, impactful message to our partners. We don't just talk to talk, but we walk to walk as well. But this is only true if our diplomats, our foreign assistants, and implementing partners reflect the diversity of America. Speaking frankly, that's not the case today. Redressing this is a top priority for me. And I'm glad to have received assurances from the Biden administration and Secretary Blinken that they also see this as urgent.
I've directed all of my staff to gather, analyze, and report on this aggregated diversity, the diversity data of our leading contractors and implementing partners, including their shareholders, their boards, and their senior staff. We will also encourage the administration to develop and implement systems and procedures to track, report, and publish this data going forward. This aggregated, this aggregated data is critical and we are to have a clear picture of the true diversity of these organizations at all levels. And the last D, but not the least, is of course democracy. For all the work any country can do to open trade and investment opportunities, democracy is the framework that keeps the economic engine going. Strong and stable democracies pave the way for stability, social trust, and strong institutions. They signal to the international business community that their investments will be secured by respect for human rights and the rule of law. Now, I reiterate my commitment to work with this administration to leverage all available tools to create and strengthen our economic ties with Africa. And given the scale of Africa's planned infrastructure development, job creation and te technological integration in the coming years, it is especially important that we scale government initiatives to integrate our capital markets, pension and investment funds, as well as venture capital ecosystems in our overall strategy for engaging with the African continent. I will work with my colleagues in Congress to ensure that our development assistance programs, including in particular those interfacing and meant to crowd in the private sector and properly authorized by Congress, that are properly authorized by Congress, adequately funded and staffed and positioned to meet the needs of the modernized US-Africa trade and investment relationships. Finally, I believe that rather than doing their work primarily from DC, and relying on contractors to represent them in Africa, our private sector and capital markets focused development programs should expand their physical presence across the continent, hiring staff directly to be on the ground, engaging firsthand with the people and its governments and businesses that they are meant to be supporting. So in closing, now, I got to tell you, I'm very, very eager to hear your thoughts and perspectives on strengthening U.S.-Africa economic ties. And I'm sure we all agree that fundamental to this process is ensuring our African partners have agency and equity. It is critical, absolutely critical, that we work with African leaders, with African leaders ensuring that they have a seat at the table and a say at the table, and that our initi initiatives fit with their broader development strategies rather than imposing on them initiatives, initiatives that are just hatched in DC without any input from them. You know, old and tired narratives about Africa must give way to sophisticated and strategic vision for our engagement. If we're not on the table, and if we're not at the table, we cannot expect that our values, democracy, good governance, human rights, and environmental protection to mirror the opportunities emerging on the continent as we speak. And I know that there's interest and it'll be up to us and many of us in the room. And I will be moving the Africa agenda and the new vision and the new partnerships that we in the United States Congress should be having with the countries on the continent to the front agenda of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. It's not going to be an afterthought. It's going to be a forethought. And working with you from MEDA and NAS will be an integral part of doing just that. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from our panelists and continuing to work with you. Thank you all. 
Thank you very much, Marks. We are looking forward to working with you and your team. Uh, as Lee stated, you were the keynote at the first Africa summit that we organized to mobilize US pension funds and US capital markets to have a deeper presence in Africa. Uh, when we worked uh, with you in the office, you were the first one to do a major investment summit for Power Africa to get uh, uh, a lot of those uh, US financial institutions to invest in power in Africa and not a new role. We very much are excited to continue to support your agenda about how we get US investors more connected with African investors for mutual benefits. So thank you so much for those remarks. As you stated, we're going to be getting our perspectives from uh, some of the key leaders in Africa uh, and internationally that we've gathered here today, uh, starting with uh, Vera Songwe. Dr. Songwe is the Under Secretary General at the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. She's one of the most respected voices in Africa and a leading, uh, leading one of its main organ international organ organizations on the continent. She was part of the Brave Trust that worked on the Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, by the African Union. And we very much have looked for her voice and her ideas on how to forge greater ties between the United States and Africa. So over to you, Dr. Sengwe, and please welcome. I have to unmute. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Emmerich, uh, for that introduction. Uh, Congressman Mix, it's a pleasure and an honor to be again with you uh, here, to be exchanging with you. Um, to all my other fellow panelists, uh, Leeds and everyone else, uh, Eric, uh, good to see you. Um, I want to maybe start with uh, where you left off, uh, Congressman Mix, and, and, and where Emmerich started which is with Mida and NASP, let me just to say that, I think uh, with everything that you've done for Mida and the support that you've given Mida, Congressman Mix, as uh, uh, Emrick was just saying, uh, we will need more of your support. We're coming out of the COVID crisis. We meet at a time when the world is, is struggling between you know, what we are all calling you know, COVID nationalism and, and multilateralism. It's an interesting juncture because we have seen you emerge as uh, uh, Emmerich said, as a distinguished uh, now congressman covering a very, very important portfolio for Africa. But also we have seen the change in the new administration and how well the response to COVID has turned around in the United States. In Africa, we are still not out of the woods yet. We're still struggling with uh, trying to see how we fight uh, COVID. And only after we have won the COVID battle will we be able to actually talk sustainably about Africa's trade investment uh, uh, prospects. But actually, even with COVID, we can actually begin to already talk about what the CFTA is doing. And thank you very much for honoring the CFTA and the work that has been put into it and looking at how American business can benefit. And there is, I think, a lot that can be done. I remember a few years ago when Senator Coons talked about creating jobs in America by doing business with Africa. I thought, huh, that's an innovative idea. But I think when we look at the fact that Johnson & Johnson is producing in Africa, uh, uh, creating jobs both in Africa and in the United States and delivering vaccines to both of us so that we can open our economies, we see that this is possible. This is happening today on vaccines, but it can happen on a lot more. What we have seen, however, in the last decade is that the United States presence, as you have said very clearly, on the continent, has really, really fallen. You know, we had a height of $150 billion of US imports from Africa in 2008. Today, we are only at 24 billion. So really almost one sixth of that number. Uh, of course, because a lot of the imports from Africa to the United States were petroleum products. And with the replacement of domestic US shale, that went down. But there is a lot more in Africa than just oil. And of course, as we're talking, we just came from you know, the historic President Biden summit where we know we wanna move away from uh, a fossil fuels to something else. But I think that move is the next opportunity for the continent and for America and the United States to work even more together. You are a leader in renewable energy technologies. You are a leader in battery storage technology. 
and Africa has the raw materials to produce that from DRC to Burundi to South Africa. And so my sense is that there is an opportunity now with this coming together of events between climate change, between the fact that you know, we want to diversify from fossil fuels to new energy. Africa needs about 500 megawatts of new energy every year to get to the 500 gigawatts, which will power the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. We need manufacturing uh, energy to actually get to where we want to be, double our GDP and increase prosperity on the continent. American business should be on the forefront of that. Um, and this is not just a hypothetical conversation. You have created the DFC, $60 billion potential investment capabilities. I think that a combination of the DFC and MEDA and NASP I can really deliver a powerful investment tool and an investment proposition for the continent. Yes, you're right. And many, many countries on the continent, despite COVID, are still taking reforms to improve their business environment, are still putting in place reforms that will you know, respond to issues of dispute settlement. Inside the AFCFTA, we already have a lot of dispute, dispute settlement uh, 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 conversations that are being done and the framework for that is already happening. There are also places where the United States and Africa need to work together and should be working together on internet security, on cyber security, on technology, on digitization. What should be the new framework for that? And I think there again, there is a lot of room for partnerships. Where can we go? What can we do? Um, New York, New York, when no one can say New York, New York without thinking about the markets, looking at how one builds, you know, the capital from the United States into the continent. I think the work that Meader and NASP are doing, amazing work. We've been fortunate to be part of that at the Economic Commission for Africa, going with them from Senegal where potential investments happen. And now I know that we should also thank you, Congressman, for being behind some of these initiatives. But we can make this initiative on the Meader and NASP much bigger um, if we had your support, your leadership, bringing together, maybe you brought it together for uh, energy uh, and Liz is also on this panel. African women, like uh, uh, the women in the United States and minority women in the United States need more access to financing, need more access to the market so that they can actually grow their businesses. Maybe we should be trading more together. Uh, African women and, and small and medium enterprises in the United States. I think that Mead and NASP and bringing together some of the pension funds can do that and do that well. We at the Economic Commission for Africa have launched a women's fund with Standard Bank. We hope that we can crowd in um, some more uh, members from the United States. But an important point, and this will be one of my last points, is what do we do post AGOA? We know that AGOA is finishing. Africa has now a blueprint for its growth on the table in the name of the AFCFTA. We're working on energy, we're working on gender, we're working on small and medium enterprises. But a big part of the trade between the United States and Africa is under the AGOA framework. And this is coming to an end. We're looking to your leadership to see how we get out of that, what we do, I think that there is a proposal on the table that says extend it until 2025 so that we can get a better sense of how we want to renew it and renegotiate it. There has been a lot of conversation about the United States getting into free trade agreements with independent countries on the continent. We think that FTAs will always exist, free trade area agreements will always exist country to country, but we also want the United States to come into Africa and trade with Africa inside the context of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, strengthen it, make it better, make it stronger, because only through this big investment proposal that is the AFCFTA, will we be able to generate growth in a way that delivers prosperity for both Africa, but we also believe um, for the United States. And finally, I think one of the big things that has come out of the COVID crisis, I started with COVID, I'm ending with COVID, is the whole question around intellectual property and what we do with intellectual property. Of course, today it has come to the fore that intellectual property agreements under the WTO are a little bit skewed for the vaccines, but also for agriculture. Africa has become a dumping ground for a lot of United States agriculture policy because we haven't sort of reviewed and reshaped a lot of this. And maybe under your leadership, if we really want a truly prosperous Africa, a truly prosperous United States that trades on an equitable basis with the continent, we will need to strengthen the WTO. Now we have Gose Okonjewale at the WTO who understands both sides of this conversation. Maybe that will also help to make Africa a much more prosperous place. Prosperous not just for Africa, but for US business more importantly, because we will become really the investment destination of choice for everybody else. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Sangwe. A loud call for uh, more trade post COVID, uh, more exchange in ICT, uh, strong call for gender economic empowerment. We'll hear more about that. I want to thank you for your time. Our next speaker is uh, Leona Bridges. She is the uh, president of the San Francisco Police Retirement System. I've had the pleasure to uh, travel to Africa three times now with Fiona. Uh, she is uh, absolutely uh, an amazing woman doing a lot of uh, great work from her role uh, as leading one of the major pension funds that has not invested in Africa's infrastructure to her charitable work, whether it's in Ghana, in Kenya, in South Africa, in building hospitals and schools. Uh, really a lot of important work that she is leading. Fiona, we're very pleased that you can join us here today and we're happy to hear from you. Over to you, please. Thank you so much, Amrick. And thank you to Congressman Meeks for his remarks and his passion and his commitment to Africa. I think it's amazing because over the years I've followed um, everything that he's been doing as well as the Congressional Black Caucus. And one of the things I can say is the caucus has always been committed to seeking investors and looking for people to invest in Africa. So every year, there's a big push and I hope they continue to encourage uh, others to invest in Africa. As uh, Amber said, uh, San Francisco Employees Retirement System has invested in Africa. Um, it's one, uh, probably a sweet part, part, part of our suite of investments that we have. Uh, Spurs has a total of 121 million committed thus far in Africa, 44 million in natural resources, uh, 40 million in uh, fixed income, 36 million in public equities, and 1.1 million in private equities. So that's where we are to date, and we will continue to explore and look at potential opportunities uh, in Africa and on the continent to see where we can make a difference uh, in this process. Uh, I think part of what MEDA and, um, has done is really opened the eyes of many investors, and I think uh, the work that Amrick and Mita through NASC uh, and it really just opening the eyes of many investors, particularly pension funds, I think that will help and that will help us to see where the potential investment opportunities are. Also, the policies that can support uh, investments or many uh, cities in the U.S. and around the country, particularly uh, pension funds, have sister cities and sister cities most of them have sister cities on the continent of Africa. It would be great if they could explore opportunities through the sister city program and see if there are potential opportunities for local leaders and governments to get together and see if there are any investment opportunities through that route as well. The other thing is just uh, looking through sponsors and projects and talking to managers on the ground in the continent of Africa. We're here in the US, so we miss some of the opportunities because we're not on the ground. I think working with local sponsors and talking to others in the investment community on the continent will help us get more exposure and more education as to what's going on and how we can deploy our resources. And then the last thing I would say is, that, as Congressman Meek said, we must, in order to make a difference, there are a lot of opportunities and in infrastructure on the continent. And I think if we look at the infrastructure opportunities that are there, and the U.S. have a strong commitment through either the pension funds or private investors, we can make a difference on the continent. And in order to make that difference, we have to be committed to it. So I would encourage pension funds and others to look at investment opportunities through the lens of looking at infrastructure first as a start, but there are so many projects. And I think as we look at the different projects throughout the continent, we'll find that we can make a difference through our dollars coming from the U.S. through either private investors or U.S. pension funds, or just really making, uh, I would say, the push to get it done. And I would encourage also to look at some of the um, strategies that the CBC have outlined over the years and make sure that we understand where uh, the Congressional Black Caucus through Congressman Meeks and others have really done a lot of work. And we can look at that research to help us do some of the education around uh, investing on the continent of Africa. I'm pleased with what SPURS has done thus far, and I hope that we can continue to make uh, investments on the continent. So thank you so much, Amrick, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you today. Thank you so much, Leona, for joining us and for those, uh, uh, for your perspective. We've uh, definitely uh, agree with you that pension funds have to play a key role 
uh, they are the ones that can invest for the long term and make the right impact. And Sephiroth is playing a leading role to show how it can be done under your leadership. And we look forward to working with you. So thank you so much, Yara. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Judge Devermont, Director of Africa Program at the Center for International Studies. He is one of the most uh, respected voice in Washington, D.C. as it relates to thinking strategically on the U.S.-Africa relations. He is definitely no stranger to the chairman as he's been, been uh, leading a lot of the key recent research and publication on the topic. So we're very pleased that you could join us today, Judge. So over to you, please. Thank you, Amrick. Uh, Chairman Meeks, wonderful to see you again. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here today with such a distinguished uh, group of panelists. I'm going to make three points. Where should U.S. investments come from? Where should they go? What should we invest in? And how do we talk about investment opportunities to the U.S. private sector? I think too often we talk about U.S. trade and investment with Africa in these broad terms. U.S. investors and firms and companies, they come from somewhere, not generically the they're in Atlanta, they're in Wichita, they're in San Francisco, uh, they're in Queens, Chairman Meeks Congressional Districts. It's in our cities and our communities, I think, where we'll find the most exciting opportunities for investment. And yet, we could do a lot more to tailor our pitch to specific communities and U.S. cities. At CSIS, we recently did uh, an interactive where we looked at 15 U.S. cities and their connections to the continent. And the conclusion was clear, whether you're based in St. Louis or Birmingham, many US companies see Africa as a key part of their global portfolio. They're eager to expand their investments and presence to create jobs at home and abroad. I thought Vera's example of Johnson & Johnson was an excellent case in point. So the sooner that we target specific US cities and especially the vibrant African diaspora, I think we'll have more success in terms of deepening US trade and investment. By the way, this works both ways. U.S. investors don't invest in Africa. They don't even invest in specific countries. They invest in cities and localities. And I thought Chairman Meeks said this eloquently, so I'll just double down. The region's urban centers are hubs of innovation, of productivity, of creativity, and genera generators of wealth. It's in African cities that I think we'll see the most enticing opportunities for U.S. trade and investment. My colleagues, Todd Moss and Judy Moore at the Center for Global Development, we recently published a paper on how the US can partner with African cities to advance this goal. And I just wanna make sure that I note uh, that Jude is a former Liberian Minister of Public Works. So as Chairman Meeks suggested, it was really important when we developed this proposal that we include African voices and have an African perspective on what would work. Second, what should we invest in? So I don't think we can just say invest in Africa. We need to be a bit more prescriptive. We need to guide our companies towards sectors that align with US comparative advantage. In my mind, that's agribusiness, energy, as Vera mentioned, entertainment, finance, healthcare, services, technology. I think that Prosper Africa, which was developed in the Trump administration was positive, but Congress and Biden's team can go a lot further here. Just look at Power Africa. I think it's a great model. Like Prosper, it was a coordination mechanism, but because it had this sectoral focus, it spurred real interest from US companies in at least power generation. And now there's been 124 transactions that are supposed to add 11,000 megawatts to the continent. This is the part that I really like. It's very like geeky Washington policy stuff, but we actually created this cohort of USAID, state, commerce, DFC officers who really knew this industry. They knew their challenges, they knew the opportunities, they knew their counterparts. That's the kind of focus we need if we really wanna be catalytic on the trade investment scene. Finally, how do we talk about investment opportunities in the US private sector? This is where I'm really very passionate about it. Every US president since Dwight Eisenhower has said, we want to, in quote, draw attention of private American capital for investment opportunities in Africa. That was a letter that Vice President Nixon wrote to him in 1957. Uh, but the problem is I think that we're too generic, as I said, and sometimes, and this may be controversial, we're a little too bullish about the investments. How many times have you heard Africa has the fastest growing economies in the world? 
it just doesn't move the needle, I think. The United States did about $32, $32 billion worth of trade investment in 2020. That's down from $36 billion in 2019. So that means that US trade with Africa is less than 1% of all of its global trade. So I think we need to invest in storytelling. We need to really work with our African partners like Unica about what are the statistics and stories and images that will really resonate with US companies. And we need to admit that there's trade-offs. It's not, you don't invest in a vacuum. Every dollar invested in Africa is one less dollar available for somewhere else. So we could be clearer about what you get when you invest in Africa versus if you invest in Vietnam or in Omaha. I think that's really important. It will help US companies make a true evaluation of their opportunities and compare the merits of African deals, which I think there are tremendous merits to some of the non-African trades and investments or even in the at home. And finally, we need to be honest about the challenges investing in Africa. And I think Chairman Meeks said this, this is not Afro-pessimism at all. Let's just communicate the opportunities in a way that comports with reality. No one assumes that an investment is going to be sort of easy, A to B complete. Everyone experiences challenges and makes adjustments. That doesn't matter if you're a tech company in the Silicon Valley or a manufacturing giant. Every story of every company is about achieving and facing adversity. And I think if we talked about that way in Africa, being clear-eyed about what it takes to succeed, I think we would talk to African, I mean, we would talk to US investors in a way they understand. So those are just a couple of points I wanted to put on the table. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Jared, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. We're pleased to have you. I definitely read your last publication and we look forward to reading more from you and uh, working with you on innovative ideas to advance US-Africa relations. So thank you. Our next speaker is Linde Kadzeze, Executive Head uh, of Global Markets uh, Sales at Standard Bank. Uh, Leads, as she's warmly called by friends, who work with her uh, is passionate about impact investing and gender economic empowerment. Is, uh, it's hard to find somebody more passionate about these topics. And uh, we've been uh, pleased to work with her on the work that they are doing across the bank. It's the leading bank in Africa. And we're pleased that they were able to offer us research for our work with NASP. And furthermore, we look forward to working with them on the partnership that they have on gender economic empowerment with the United Nations. So Liz, to share her, her perspective with us here today, I'm pleased you can join us and over to you. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Emmerich. Good morning um, or good afternoon, wherever you are joining from. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Mead Advisors and NASC for this incredible opportunity to be a part of this very important and timely dialogue to drive solutions that will strengthen the economic ties between the United States of America and the African continent. I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience and my fellow panelists for taking the time to be with us. And a special warm welcome to Chairman Mix. Thank you. We are deeply and eternally grateful for you, to you for your time and the leadership you represent. I'm going to make my, a few comments around how do we partner and mobilize our collective efforts to drive growth in Africa while pursuing gender economic empowerment. Africa's private sector institutions like Standard Bank play a big role to support trade and investment on the continent. We can only accomplish this by partnering with US investors and US agencies like the DFC to remove barriers and support risk mitigation solutions to enable US investors to co-invest in opportunities on the continent. As Standard Bank, our deep connections, our strong networks and close ties with our clients put us in a unique position to be able to be a thought leader uh, in this space and also provide actionable insights. Every person on the audience so far has mentioned pension funds, asset managers, corporates. These are our clients and this is where Standard Bank plays a big role. And this is where we'd like to actually partner with you all. Standard Bank sees gender not only as a fundamental human right, but also as a business imperative. Our group CEO, Mr. Sim Shabalala, is the thematic champion 
for the she, he for she movement, which is an internal uh, international um, uh, mobilization led by UN uh, women. Um, when we look as to what is happening across the continent, we realize that our organizations, the US and Africa need to work together to close the funding gap in Africa. There's a really important work that's being done in this space that we should continue to advance. Through our partnership with uh, UNECA, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA for short, uh, Standard Bank launched the African Women Impact Initiative at the AU Summit in February 2020. Our aim is to create a sustainable investment platform to grow the number of women asset managers on the continent. This will help close the fundamental gap women managers experience to access private and public investment in the ecosystem. You may ask why this fund is important. Women manage less than 6% of funds in Africa and typically only get funding for microtype initiatives. Our initiative aims to, or to, or to, to, to allocate, to help women scale the, the, man, the decisions that make and be able to allocate, uh, provide a, a, be a decision makers in allocating larger amounts of capital. Larger pension funds, DFIs and uh, uh, foundations have been doing manager selection on the continent for a number of years now, but their efforts only really tend to support one manager at a time. Our approach will allow for a positive impact at a, on a much larger scale that will bring multiple levels of diversification. This is across asset classes, geographical speeds and manager diversification. All the investors that seek investments in Africa want to be associated with real economy and impact related sectors. And we have received strong applicants that will look to allocate um, to climate change, healthcare, education, fintech, and agriculture. When we launched this initiative at the AU Summit, uh, the last in-person AU Summit in Addis in 2020, the Prime Minister of Canada, Norway, the President of South Africa, Rwanda, Senegal, among others, all made financial commitments to this initiative or gender empowerment in Africa. At that time, we were missing the voice of the United States of America. Now Standard Bank, alongside our partners, is asking for your help, Chairman Mix, to help join as we seek to impart to gender economic empowerment in Africa. We'll be grateful for your support to empower women fund managers on the continent. This is an initiative that has been led by UNECA and has received great support from Standard Bank. And uh, thank you, Emmerich, and thank you everyone on the panel for this time. I will pause there. Thank you so much, Leeds, and a strong call for action on gender economic empowerment. Thank you for carrying that voice and for sharing your perspective with us today. We have one more speaker, Eric Kaku, CEO of Entrepreneurial Solutions Partners. It's hard not to be impressed by Eric's passion for entrepreneurship in Africa, but he doesn't just talk. He has 10 years track record in 10 countries in Africa with 50 million of investments already mobilized on, with, for entrepreneurs across the continent. He represents a success story of how Africans can bring solutions to African problems by working with US partners. So we'd love to hear from you, Eric, and I'm pleased you can join us here today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Um, there is something that the congressman said which really caught my attention. He said that uh, he wanted to make sure that as uh, the US looks at a way to reset its relationship with Africa, Africans were not only uh, had a seat at the table, but they also had a, 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 actually a say at the table. So I would like to say thank you to Mida and Nas for making sure that the table is here, all of us being able to talk. And then thank you to, to the congressman for listening, because uh, I mean, sometimes we invite people at the table, but we don't want to listen. And the way this panel is structured uh, is a very strong symbol that you actually mean business and we are in good hands. Um, personally, I am very, 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 many, many, very excited about the reset because Honestly, for some of us who were US trained, who are in the trenches on the continent, 
the past five years have been tricky, but this is not a political uh, panel. So this is the last comment I will make on this topic. Um, I wanted to really make one main point today. The point I would like to make is that the reset that you would like to see of the US-Africa relationship must go through entrepreneurship. So whatever we do, if we are not able to empower African entrepreneurs, African women entrepreneurs, African uh, male entrepreneurs, if we're not able to empower them, we are not going to succeed. So I'm going to break my remarks into three points. The first one, I will give you a few data points. Second, I will speak to why entrepreneurship, and then I will give you some ideas for how we actually make it happen. So uh, there is a proverb that says that uh, the only investment with the potential for infinite returns is an investment in babies. Because when we invest in a baby, when we invest in a youth, we don't know if we're investing in a scientist. We don't know if we're investing in the congressman. We don't know if we're investing in some of the leaders that are on the panel today. So if we can invest in youth, that's something that's actually very important. Today, 10 of the youngest countries um, in the world are actually in Africa. And those countries have a median age, which is less than 17.5 years. 70% of African youth uh, live on less than $2 a day. I think Judd was actually saying that while we want uh, US investors to come, it's very important that we give the actual facts so that we can make some sort of informed decision. And then finally, pre-COVID, we actually had 12 million Africans entering the job market every day. This is actually pre-COVID. And this has to be contrasted with only 3 million jobs created every year. I'm suspecting that with COVID, the statistic is actually going to be higher. So why do I believe so much in entrepreneurship? For the very simple reason that in my experience, the only way we can transform potential, which Africa has plenty of, into prosperity is by creating products which are going to be made by actual human beings, so create jobs, but those teams have to be led by entrepreneurs, right? And in my work over the past uh, 10 years, I have met a number of those entrepreneurs. And every day, uh, those entrepreneurs are the reason why I'm so excited about the things that we do. So now, how do we make it happen? Uh, and this is where I'm going to try and speak to what the US can do, which will be peculiar and different. First of all, is about making sure we can actually drive innovation. So if we want to be able to mint the next generation of African entrepreneurs at scale, we are not going to do it with traditional approaches. We are not going to do it with traditional programs. We have to be able to innovate, right? The experience that I have had on the ground is that over the past five years, while the US was trying to rethink some of its approaches, you have other players who have emerged and who tend to be a little bit more nimble. Right? You have the French on culture, you have the Belgian on the sort of, uh, sort of climate, but I can go ahead and cite a number of players like that. But even within the US, you have different type of players. You have USAID, who's central to anything to do with development on the continent, and you have USADF, right? very small. The first one invests maybe $700 million a year in economic development for the continent. The second one only has about 50 million to invest every year, right? The second one works with indigenous businesses. The second one in my, in my, in my sort of experience is a lot more nimble, works to build the capacity of the people that they actually work with. So I think it's really important in the sort of innovation that we look at, and you actually mentioned the issue of having, I, I think a diverse set of uh, partners you work with. I think you, you need to kind of innovate for that to happen. And you also will need to innovate as it relates to the kind of financing you put on the table, right? So because honestly, if we use the traditional tools, it's not going to work. The second thing that I would like to basically advocate for is really uh, blended capital slash impact investing. Those two things are different, but the basic idea is that we have to bring money and technical assistance and capacity building at the same time. If we want entrepreneurs to thrive, we have to help them identify the right opportunities and we have to coach them through getting to those opportunities while we fund them. If we do one or the other, then it doesn't work. That's something that I wrote about, 
I, 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 in, in, in the first book that I wrote, because clearly from what I saw on the ground, this is a problem. Often we give funding on one side, technical assistance on the other side. If you don't bring the right combination at the same time, it doesn't work. And then finally, you need, I would call it a pass key, right? A pass key. The good news is you already have that pass key, right? There are a number of people on this call, whether it's the panelists or some of the participants who are actually US trained members of the Africa diaspora. I was looking at some of the people that are there. I saw that there was like Kedaladi there, Tari there, Dissimo, uh, Eric Wright, Ephraim, Monira, Obina, Omoale. All these people were trained in the US. They came back to the continent because they want to actually do business on the continent the same way that I did. I think if you can identify some of those players and find a way to actually scale the work that they are doing after you actually check them out, I think that's one of the ways that can work. So I would like to thank you again for listening. I would like to thank uh, Mida and Nas for setting the table. And I am very, very excited about the reset. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, and a strong call on action on entrepreneurship in Africa. And we uh, fully or aligned with uh, your approach as a way to create sustainable jobs across the continent. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I'm going to now ask the uh, chairman to respond to some of the uh, key themes we've heard from the speakers today. Uh, and after the congressman is able to respond, we have some remarks that will be shared by Greg Floyd from New York City. We definitely want to hear from him as well. But before that, over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I'm gonna be brief uh, because I thought all of the comments made by our panelists were uh, very, very good. I tried to take some notes as they were uh, speaking. So uh, I just will be brief about just some notes that I took. Uh, first, uh, in regard to Executive Secretary Songway's um, point, you know, the AFC uh, FTA uh, as a launching pad is, is, is good, but the focus on women and youth uh, for in, an inclusive economic development, I think it's, it's critical. And it's also critical that we in the United States uh, um, actively engage in and offer, you know, and this is something uh, that was talked about often about the critical technical uh, support that's needed. Uh, and we have that, that opportunity to do that. We have a lot to offer, I believe, and we can build uh, to expand these economic ties and including, you know, I think it's important to bring in the service industry, uh, which is what the United States really excels in. Uh, and so uh, that, 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 that's really, really uh, important. Uh, and being focused on a uh, developing strategy for uh, energy infrastructure uh, and the need for energy, you know, high capacity energy to support manufacturing, uh, while also including renewables to the stem, you know, so that you can stimulate the, uh, the continent's uh, carbon uh, e emissions. Uh, I, you know, I think that we can do this and we can work uh, together on that. Uh, also, you know, she mentioned the WTO, uh, and making sure that it works. Uh, I think that is absolutely critical. Uh, you know, the WTO and making sure that we are working to as far as uh, the IP for agriculture. Uh, that I think that that's another focus that is tremendously important and point well, 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 well taken. Um, see if I can read my notes here. So with uh, Ms. Bridges, sister cities initiatives. And I know I advocate that in a very, very, very big way in New York to try to make sure that uh, we have these sister cities uh, because that, that helps, you know, when you talk about bringing local governments and businesses uh, together and you can thrive. I can think of a number of businesses that we have in New York uh, that they're looking to grow uh, and to say that we are sister cities and have the, you know, the, the New York city government, is, you know, that's what we talking about the urbanization earlier. There's some urban markets right here. Uh, that is uh, great. And, and, and if we, could focus even on the civic and healthcare solutions on the ground uh, that target specific needs of each community. Then that gets people also to have confidence in government, which I think that can make a tremendous difference. 
and extremely important. And then I further think that we could build on those initiatives and explore partnerships, for example, with historically black college and universities, uh, including exchange programs and bilateral educational partnerships and, and career development opportunities. So I think that uh, that's some place that, uh, 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 that we can go. Uh, you know, he also, she also mentioned public private partnerships. Uh, and I think that's extremely important. I'm a big believer in public private partnerships and having pension funds invested in the right way, leveraging and talking to uh, uh, our various states and, and, and cities so that we can know that, you know, the pension funds are, are being properly invested and invested on the, in, 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 uh, on the continent. Uh, as to Judd, and I, you know, Judd, I, I think that your, 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 your three ideas focus on uh, specific cities is right on the money, basically what we were talking about before. Uh, what should we invest in? Uh, you know, that's uh, very important when you're thinking about this through and how do we talk about uh, investment opportunities in Africa? Uh, that, that's tremendously uh, something that how dialogue and conversation. And, and, and when I look at the idea, you mentioned uh, the uh, Prosper Africa, which was done in the Trump administration. I think that was, uh, that's a good idea offering a coordination point for, uh, for capital markets uh, mobilization on the continent, separate from the work of the DFC. But I think that what we have to make sure that happens there and also, and you, and you, uh, and you included that, is establishing, uh, is, is, is having a deeper engagement with Congress. That's something that I think that Congress should be uh, further uh, uh, moved in. A any program should be authorized by Congress and its mandate and scope of work should uh, would be clarified to avoid duplication. We don't need the, you know, further any duplications of work with other government programs. And I think that the work should be uh, transparent and have stable funding and also made accountable to us in Congress. Uh, so I, I had, uh, a number of folks on my team actively looking at this and looking more broadly at how to better coordinate and build our experience on engaging uh, with U.S. investment funds and capital markets uh, to expand uh, their footprint uh, on, on the continent. And again, you know, as I said, pension funds and investments are key to meeting Africa's infrastructure needs. I don't think that uh, we can do it uh, 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 with, without it. Uh, and as to uh, Ms. Zadeh, uh, uh, advancing party, advancing gender parity. I think that's what she was talking about. Yes, uh, and women, and uh, and is is absolutely key. Uh, it's uh, to be inclusive in growth and poverty reduction. You've got to be uh, sure that you're investing in women. If you don't do that. You're not going to reduce poverty and you're not going to be able to grow. And so to have gender parity, it's absolutely essential. Now, I know that, you know, and I'm and traveling uh, to Africa, uh, well, now we missed the year because of the pandemic, but I, I want to be cautious not to generalize because I did see some parts of Africa are starting to do relatively well in gender parity. You know, you see some who have elected women presidents and are business leaders. I met with a few in the United States, uh, just had lunch uh, uh, with former President Sirleaf, uh, for example. But there's other parts of the continent that are severely la are lagging and, uh, and investing in women at every level from the civil society to education, to STEM and entrepreneurship and asset management uh, will be critical uh, I think in, achieve, in achieving Africa's development goals. Uh, and we've got to move uh, 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 from there uh, in that regards. Uh, and, uh, and I also uh, want to say I could occur, I know, you know, for a large part of the last four years, as, as you indicated, the missing voice of US support over the last four years. One of the things that I think that President Biden and his administration uh, is putting forward that America will be back at the table with a voice. And part of that voice is also listening to other voices and bringing together and having a leadership role in that. So I think that you can expect uh, America to have a voice, to be back at the table uh, and, and to make sure that we're working with others like 
Standard Bank. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's tremendously important. And thank you for all that you do and the contributions that, 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 that you have made. Um, and, and lastly, uh, Mr. Kaku, um, your uh, uh, conversation about entrepreneurship, drive innovation, and what I thought was key too, is capacity building and funding at the same time. Capacity building and funding at the same time so that we're creating those jobs and opportunities there uh, to have the technology and tech entrepreneurship that is necessary. And that's what needs both the capital as well as the capacity building. Uh, and that will help accelerate economic development and job creation. That's the only way that you can do both. So I think that's really, really important. You know, as I said during uh, to my, you know, dealing to, to, to judge, do Mr. Judge, comments to Mr. Judge, I can really see fostering a deeper engagement with the African, uh, with the American startup and venture capital ecosystems as a priority area. And, uh, and as well as African governments and leaders need to be, uh, uh, need to appreciate the value of this space, which is so important and foster supportive environments. So, um, uh, and I, as I say that, I wanna say that this is not something that's just unique to Africa. It's not a uniquely African challenge, but one where I think that Africa uh, has the most to gain, uh, actually, uh, creating not only millions of jobs that will be needed to create employment for the young population entering into the job market, but also uh, creating homegrown solutions to the local problems. Um, look, all uh, of the presenters are just fantastic. We're just fantastic. And having the opportunity to listen and hear and work with some in the past and those that I have not worked with, uh, I look forward to working with uh, in the future. We are going to, uh, and it's going to take this kind of sessions and, uh, and bringing us together as NAS and media, media is doing. I am just so proud of both Lee and Americ, and I didn't mention, you know, I, I, I can't get away without talking about Donna Sims Wilson, who really, you know, at that time, she had me at these summits at the beginning uh, and talking about it. And I think looking at the continent in a different way, uh, we just clicked. And I, so I just can't not miss, I gotta make sure I mention Donna, who's my friend and buddy uh, and all that she does and trying to make sure we're our financial institutions that there's a connection therein, uh, which is tremendously important. So um, I thank each and every one of you. I look forward, you know, and, and we need to continue these dialogues led by NAS and Nita is to have some, especially when we get past this pandemic and we can do, I'd be like in-person meetings. I know we got to do what we have to do now with reference to Zoom. And I've Zoomed out almost on so This was so important. Uh, but to do some in-person uh, in strategic meetings together along with others so that we can make sure um, that we work. Oh, I know what I forgot to mention. Uh, someone was talking about how we rethink a goal. And that's really important also. Uh, and how we can make sure, you know, we talked about, you know, when we talk about the trade, just like the big issue was how are we going to deal with NAFTA and make sure that we came up with a new NAFTA that would be more based upon and not what was taking place in the 90s when it was created, but now how we can look forward because the world has changed so much since then. So it is with a with, with GOA. So much has changed since we first uh, initiated our GOA uh, uh, deal. And uh, we've got to look at a GOA and make sure that we are coming up with the renewed GOA that's 10, thinking 10, 15, 20 years ahead. Uh, so that we can make sure we take advantage of it. I'll stop there. I've talked too long because I know my good friend uh, and President uh, Gregory Floyd is on deck. Uh, I just want to thank everybody so much for uh, all that you are doing and will do uh, to better the relationship and the growth and the opportunity of uh, both the United States uh, and the continent, the various countries, the continent, the 54 countries on the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh... We are so forward looking to working with you and your team on all those key topics you mentioned. And I can tell you Donna's listening and uh, you know she'll uh, make sure that we follow up with you. So we look forward to it. But as you stated, we have uh, Greg Floyd next. He is a member of the NASMEDA Advisory Council 
obviously leading one of the most important uh, unions and organizations in New York City. He's also a trustee of the New York City Employees Retirement System. And through his leadership, the pension fund has started to do some research on Africa. And we very much appreciate his leadership as a member of our advisory council. So Greg, over to you. Thank you. And I, I wanna thank uh, Mita and um, NAS for getting uh, this uh, eclectic group and panelists together and allowing me to come just to say a few closing remarks. I also wanna congratulate uh, Chairman uh, Gregory Meeks, who is my Congressman and we've been friends for a long time uh, on his new chairmanship. And as a fellow New Yorker, I not only have a great feeling of pride in seeing him elevated to this post, but I'm also confident that his know-how and that his unique style will serve us well. I wish him every success. As a trustee of NICES, I can tell you that is really a daunting task to oversee $96 billion with the mandate, not just to keep the funds from dwindling, but to help us grow the funds. Many of our affected people, uh, many people are affected by decisions at NICES. There are 190,572 active members. 154,116 pensioners and beneficiaries and 28,483 vested members. That's over 373,000 people. It's a heavy responsibility. And our goal to protect and increase the funds of NICES passed a resolution to look into investment opportunities in Africa. I have always believed NICES should prudently invest in emerging and frontier markets for the purposes of diversifying our assets while also assisting in development and important and current future lucrative markets. The continent of Africa presents a good fit. In fact, such studies have indicated that despite Africa's current reliance on fossil fuels is plentiful sun and other natural renewables resources could serve as a key to the economics, uh, continents, economics and social developments. For example, Forbes magazine reports that Africa could deliver energy independence through access to low cost climate-friendly energy, Egypt, uh, electricity, Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco, and Africa, South Africa, have made large investments in renewables, in particular in sun, solar power. Some smaller African nations have set ambitious decarbonization targets such as Rwanda's target of achieving 60% renewable energy generation by 2030. It is for all of these reasons and more that Africa offers attractive investment possibilities for NYCHA. In my view, we should welcome and explore partnerships and support opportunities for trade and investments in the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you again for those uh, closing remarks to uh, conclude the discussion today with the chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, we again wanna thank you so much for your time, for joining us here today to share with us your, your, your priorities as it relates to your US-Africa economic ties. We look forward to working with you. I want to also thank our panelists for joining us here today, for sharing your perspective with the chairman and sharing solutions that can bring about innovative, innovative change in US-Africa relations. I want to thank my, uh, uh, my colleagues at NASP and at MIRA Advisors for organizing this discussion here today. We are running out of time and won't be able to take any questions. 
but we are going to allow the uh, members from the audience to share with us online some of your ideas. We'll be able to follow up and share them with the office of the chairman. If you have anything, any ideas you want to share with us, please do, go ahead and use the chat to do so, and we'll make sure we we'll follow up with the chairman's office. But with that, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. And put special uh, thank you to, Mr. to the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Great, great mix. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.